Boils and ghouls, this is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, joined by my co-host, Angelique. Say hello, Angelique. Hello. And Daniel. Say hey, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. That's not important. Get get to the good. Get to the good. This evening, <laughs> we're joined by a very special guest, director, screenwriter, and producer, Mr. Ted Nicolau. Ted, how the hell you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Justin. How you doing? Hey, Daniel. Hey, Angelique. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> It's a pleasure to have you, man. Let's start at the beginning to make it easy. Take us back in time. When you're a kid, what sort of films, music, books, comics, etc., were you consuming that got your juices flowing? When I was a kid, my dad worked really hard during the week, but on Saturdays, he would take me to, to the Saturday afternoon matinee monster movies in the 50s at uh, some local theaters in Dallas. So I came away from that with a really great love of, of horror films and, and monster movies, science fiction films. And reading Famous Monsters magazine also kind of really fired my imagination. And in there were some films that I would never get to see until I went to the University of Texas and started studying film. But yeah, it was basically my dad turned me on to movies. And then Friday nights and Saturday nights out of Fort Worth, there was like the midnight movies of the old Universal horror films. So sort of, I kind of got very well educated in horror films. Any of them jump out at you in particular? Like any of them just kind of like... That that's it. I was like a Frankenstein uh, fan. That was that was sort of my favorite monster. Didn't really like uh, vampire movies all that much. Werewolf movies, I loved those, but I, I really was drawn to the kind of UFO films of the 50s. And there was one that I saw the trailer for when I was a kid and didn't see it because uh, it never made it to Dallas, Earth versus Flying Saucers. Seeing that when I was in school and then using a bunch of clips from it in my film, Terror Vision. Yeah, holy crap. Yeah, yeah, I love that film. I mean, the the scenes of destruction were just fired my imagination as a kid. Ted, you just mentioned Texas. So how was the University of Texas film program back in those days? Back in those days, the University of Texas film program was very small. We had like a little mansion kind of at the edge of campus. We had money coming from whatever was educational television, national broadcasting, whatever it was. Back in, back in those days, it wasn't quite PBS yet, but they provided us with funding to, to make our films and then a platform to show them. We had a great teacher in a guy named Rod Whitaker, who was also the novelist known as Trevanian, who wrote The Iger Sanction. And he was a great inspiration for us. And then we had a couple of other teachers who were also, you know, kind of taught us what it would be like to deal with Hollywood producers. Like what got you doing horror? Was it, did you just naturally seg into that? Or did you do a whole bunch of student films in sci-fi and then just start going into horror of your own accord? Or I guess, was it, you know, have to do horror or I really want to do horror? You know, what no, was I started out wanting to do comedies. And so my student films are all basically either kind of absurd absurdist stories, or I did a movie about 40 days of flooding in the United States and the flood refugees overrunning cities. Did a movie about the man with a million dollar smile who was like star of toothpaste commercials. So I was doing comedies basically, but I was also playing in a band called Ramon and Ramon and the Four Daddios that was kind of like a <laughs> premier hippie party band. And so I sort of split my time between making movies and playing music until I finally just went, okay, the band 
band is too much trouble. It's hard to <laughs> hard to get everybody on the same drug to play music <laughs> at the same time. So we just basically I kind of went whole hog into the film department. What were you playing in that band? I was playing guitar and and singing and writing songs and we kind of were like a psychedelic fifties song. So we play like uh, oldies, but like from sort of an acid tinged perspective. Mm. So it's nice. kind of a crazy, crazy band. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Is, now is guitar something you still do or have you not picked it up? Yeah, right yeah, I still have a guitar. I still play it like whenever I have time. Yeah. They haven't picked up or formed any bands or side project. Got like this, you know, closeted black metal project that you go by the name like <laughs> the, the Emerald Dagger or something like that. So no, one knows no, who you are. no, I'm kind of, I'm tempted every once in a while, but the, the time it would take to kind of do it is just too, too much. You know. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Ted, I'm looking at your credits here. So was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre your very first professional gig? I was uh, involved with this company that we did like training films and educational films and things for the state of Texas. But Chainsaw was the first feature experience that I had. Yeah. And what an experience to have. <laughs> it sure was, man. It was a crazy, crazy experience, you know, working with Toby Hooper and in the hot blistering summer sun of texas and not really knowing kind of what we were making not understanding how how amazing it was going to turn out you know but yeah so that was the first experience and i was just the sound recordist on the film so it was my responsibility to make sure you could hear all the uh, dialogue well my question about texas chainsaw what makes that noise during the opening credits that swing what what is that <laughs> you know i do not know actually oh. <laughs> no i mean they i know toby and wayne bell who was like my boom operator did the score and and just you know used metal objects and probably might be like a like some kind of a scythe being sharpened or something but but they they kind of created all those sound effects I was wondering if some of that was like them manipulating, like pulling a nail from a board and then just manipulating certain sounds. I like could get that just the way that it elongates and it holds that resonating tone. I was yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure they played with that a lot, but I'm not, you know, I wasn't around for that part of it. Now, were you there just for the recording or were you basically it's because of, and I, just because I mean, you tag team and you know, Charles Band is going to get mentioned sooner or later, but because we got Texas Chainsaw Massacre because of him. And oh, that's funny. Uh, you know what? He bought the rights to it or licensed the rights to it for a short period of time in the 80s, probably, I guess. Like, uh, yeah, I bet it was the 80s and released it. I think, one, you know, when he he was kind of the first to realize the potential in VHS cassettes and that sort of distribution of films. So, so yeah, I remember he got the Chainsaw Massacre for a period, but it was released theatrically by this mafia a company called Bryanston and <laughs> then was picked up by some other company. I mean, it's, it's really made the rounds. And the reason I was asking that is, you know, because the tie-in between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and you, and I had, if I had known, I had completely forgotten until about half an hour ago when Justin reminded me that you were involved in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I'm seeing, you know, in the background, you knowing Charles Band for, you know, obviously quite a long time. And I'm just curious as to how that overlap, because as I said, with him getting Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we basically have it because of him and the whole wizard video big box thing. So if, somehow you were involved in that or if you saw what Charles Band did for that and that kind of helped guide you along into how you would navigate the scene. I was just curious. No, basically I came, uh, you know, we did Chainsaw Massacre. We tried to raise money to do this ghost story in, in Texas. But after Chainsaw Massacre, the tax breaks that were afforded like oil millionaires through film investment kind of vanished. And so there was no more opportunity really to raise the money to do films like there was for Chainsaw. So eventually a lot of my friends kind of had moved out to Los Angeles and they kept telling me I should come out. And so finally I just kind of 
packed up my van. My van was the green chainsaw massacre van that's in the film. So I packed that up with all my shit. Yeah. (laughs) And drove out to Los Angeles, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies or something and got a job on a movie called Roar. I don't know if you've heard of this film. It's like the most kind of what the fuck were they thinking movie that's (laughs) ever existed. uh, uh, Tippi Hedren stars in it along with Melanie Griffith and Tippi's husband, Noel Marshall, produced and directed and starred in it. It's about a guy studying lions and tigers in Africa and living with a hundred lions and tigers in his house and his family comes to visit and kind of the <laughs> mayhem that ensues from that. But it was actually shot with a hundred lions and tigers, no trainers anywhere <laughs> around, no Marshall just trying to, you know, bully the lions into behaving and people were injured on it and the animal planet uh, did a documentary on it that i think you can find on amazon or something called roar the most dangerous movie ever made or something like yeah, that. yeah it's and, awesome yeah it is amazing huh yeah it's like so it, it was unbelievable so that was like my first experience in los angeles working on that film but after six months of working on it, it was the the set and the whole compound and all the cutting rooms were kind of out in uh, in uh, Soledad Canyon outside of Los Angeles. And it was a really rainy season and dam kind of up river from the kind of flood plain that they were shooting in uh, broke and washed away a million feet of work picture, buried all the chems, the, the editing machines like up to their heads. So then we spent the next three or four months just digging out the machines and taking them apart to their little components and cleaning them and uh, to, uh, digging the film out down river as much of the work picture as they could find and oh, man. washing that with garden hoses and taking it to the lab to clean it up so that ended up taking so long the a uh, guy named Larry Carroll who had hired me on as editor of, of Roar had moved on and started working for Charlie Band to produce the film Tourist Trap which was directed by David Schmoller who was another film school friend of mine so they kind of hired me away from Roar and I uh, went to work for Charles Band at that point like 1970 eight i believe it wasn't full moon back then was it what was like what was his moniker at that time or was it full moon i think it was charles band productions at that time he had a small office with a couple of cutting rooms and a little sound stage and was producing tourist trap and a movie called uh, the daytime ended and his father albert band who was a film director was directing a movie called She Came to the Valley, I think, like a a kind of a Western. So it was a very active, but very tiny little place. Before we get to the meat, hit me with Terror Vision. How did that, where did that come from? (laughs) Uh, Terror Vision. uh, So I I edited Tourist Trap and then Charlie started hiring me to edit other films. And then I was editing the the movies that he was directing and and, uh, we were getting along really well. And finally, I I let him know that I kind of set out in life to be a director so any chance i had to direct a film i would look i would take it there was a, a short little directorial test in um, a movie called god it's been gone, went by so many different names but i think it's a it was rage war and you know a, a bunch of little kind of episodic pieces little films short films that charlie was testing directors for i edited that film and let him know that i wanted to direct Uh, one of the episodes too. So I did a little short test. And then when Charlie had Empire and was actually making movies for a decent budget, the way he would do it is he would commission poster artists to come up with posters for the ideas in his head. And then he'd bring you into his office and show you some posters and say, well, which one of these appeals to you? So he showed me the poster of television, which was, you know, a monster coming out of a TV set, uh, kind of a generic monster. But I said, oh, I'll do that one if I can make it a comedy. Charlie wasn't really known for comedies at the time, but, but he said yes. And so that kind of set me off onto the onto television so basically it was the idea monster comes out of a family's tv set go for it and so then i wrote the script based on that you wrote the script now the concept art that he showed you was that the final art that we have now or was it incredibly similar because television that is one of those iconic box arts i 
probably speak for i'm pretty sure i speak for angelique also though that as a kid when we would go to the video store and you're strolling through the horror section and you're seeing all that rad box art terror vision was one of those that i can recall like when i see it i immediately recognize it i remember it has i mean it's a bluer shade but it, it kind of a lot of it reminds me of like nightmare on elm street 3 it just it might have even been the same artist but it just has that look so i was just curious if the concept art that you saw for terror vision before writing it if it was similar to like no actually the the concept art for television at the time was just like a old school tv set and this kind of goofy monster kind of leaping out i think after i wrote the script and it became you know the the satellite dish and the, maybe the satellite dish was part of the original uh, concept too i i have to go track that down but and then we designed the monster with uh, john beekler's crew and the tentacle with the eyeball on top then i then i think the poster <laughs> eventually reflected more what the movie was was. Charlie's poster artists were great. And that was kind of the, the kind of selling point of his company was that he really knew how to market those films. I, yeah, yeah. I victim. <laughs> yeah, it was like a hungry bunch of 13 year olds, you know, that were looking for those movies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so i guess to get to it like how far apart was terrorvision in comparison with subspecies when did you first get into that well terrorvision was 19 we shot it in 85 and it was released in 86 and it was so resoundingly hated by critics everywhere good and, and <laughs> that's what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah it, it kind of like set me back for a while just the the because you know you make a movie and you're yeah. proud of it and you think you know it's it's going to be great and all of that and then when it just flops so spectacularly kind of took a couple of years to kind of go okay what am i doing next you know and and charlie was really supportive and and you know even if it flopped theatrically i'm sure he sold enough uh video cassettes that it mm. kind of you know made its money back and then he and those days he was selling foreign rights too and so i'm sure he made plenty of money so he kind of put me to work developing some other screenplays but took a while to find one that actually got made. I wrote some scripts and there was uh, one that was going to be wonderful called, it started out as Space Sluts in the Slammer, but it was going to be called <laughs> Space Cadets or something like that. Kind of a sex farce in outer space. I wrote the script. It was really good, really funny. And it was going to be shot on the sound stages in Italy that, uh, that uh, Peter Manugian's film Arena was shot on yeah you know, outer space sets i went over there we started pre-production and that was the moment at which empire pictures kind of collapsed mm. and so the plug got pulled on that one so it was frustrating frustrating i went back and edited some more films for charlie until he got full moon kind of up and running and he called me in and proposed to me this movie called subspecies that he basically had a there was a romanian expatriate who was living in the states who after the revolution 1989 wanted to go back and start doing business in in Romania and proposed to Charlie a deal whereby the Romanian government would pay for the Romanian costs, all the, the crew and the equipment and all of that from the studio there at Bufta. And Charlie would pay for the American costs. Uh, the actors, post-production, music, all of that. And I think he offered it first to Stuart Gordon and Stuart said, nah, I don't want to go to, to Romania. So he sent me to Romania just to kind of scout locations and, and meet the key people there. So I spent a week in Romania kind of traveling from Bucharest up to Transylvania, seeing the locations, spec spectacular places and beautiful Orthodox churches and meeting Vlad Paunescu, who was going to be the director of photography, who didn't speak English, but his girlfriend, Juana Tofan at the time, and now she's his wife. She was a costume designer and she could speak a, enough English that we could kind of hang out and communicate. So I ended up getting really close to them just in that one week of traveling together. And came back to Charlie and said, man, if, if we can shoot there, the locations are spectacular. The equipment yeah. is old, funky old crap. But, you know, it's going to look kind of like a weird European chamber movie, but it could be amazing. 
So uh, took about another month or two, I guess, and I went back to Bucharest and started prep for subspecies. You just touched on it a little bit, Ted. I got to ask you this. You guys filmed those movies at a very interesting time, to put it mildly, for Romania, directly after the fall of communism. Can you talk about what that experience was like from the filming perspective? <laughs> yeah, it was going to Bucharest at that time. Everything seemed very sinister. There was like no color anywhere. There was no, you know, you're coming from the state you're used to bright advertisements and you know stuff that you can buy just immense amounts of shit that you can buy well there it was like everything gray very few cars on the street everybody huddled very unhappily everybody wearing really kind of just old communist clothes you could buy candy bars but you'd have to go pay for them with dollars there was very few light bulbs in the chandeliers so hotels were dark there was always some pimps and hookers in the hotel bars kind of lounging about and the crews were film crews are lively incredible people but they were drinking like crazy so so we'd have a production meeting and and it would be like glasses of vodka you know like tumblers full of vodka and until by the end it was just crazy screaming and and vlad would just look at me and and uh and go don't worry ted be happy you know uh and and you know you go to romania at 1980 1990 you, you the first three weeks you're just going what the fuck was i thinking why am i here i wish i was home and you're just a big baby but vlad and juana kind of took me in and and uh, so i would spend a lot of evenings at their apartment drinking wine and eating they took me to the theater uh, and that was the first hint that i had that in romania as bleak as it seemed there was this amazing society of actors that were so on fire and even in in the days of communism theater was like really important and it still is important to this day and and every city has a number of theaters and the actors would do their performances and then gather at this bar behind the national theater and just uh, i went there with lon and juana and it was like being in paris in the 20s or something just that amazing but back to the filmmaking part of the whole thing in at the time you know the cameras were very old and funky the laboratory was not very good. The support gear, you know, instead of big silks to kind of block the sun, they used tablecloths. And, you know, we would go to these locations and with as, as minimal equipment as we had, the crew was really smart and engineering savvy and Vlad was a really great cinematographer and we went up to the mountains and spent a lot of time up in Poyana Brashov like this little ski resort town up in the mountains in a hotel that was again dark because there were no light bulbs in the chandeliers very little food in the restaurant and chicken that was always a little too bloody and you, to make a call home would take like two or three hours and sometimes wouldn't happen that day you know you'd have to go to the post office and sit there and wait for the phone call to go through you know once once the crew was there and uh, once uh, the cast was there it, it became a lot more productive you know and and you forget about going home because the kind of work that's ahead of you is just so intense i was really lucky to have honest hove the the guy who plays radu and subspecies you know at first it was laura tate and and michelle mcbride and a bunch of romanian actors and uh, mike michael watson that on the first subspecies it was very difficult because the wine was so cheap and honest loved to drink and michael watson loved to drink and they got the the female actresses all drunk at night and it was just a big mess every night of people <laughs> screaming and yelling and because we felt like we were going to be there forever because everything was much slower than we thought we were supposed to be there for like three or four weeks and suddenly it was stretching on to six weeks eight weeks you know 10 weeks so i basically started keeping a journal every <laughs> night just to keep myself sane you know just to kind of turn it into comedy and and that's how the first one kind of got made it was like against all odds against people not even believing it was going to be any good and you know i don't know it's not it's it's a flawed film for sure oh but to hell with that, that it, it, it's got it's got a lot of atmosphere you know and uh i was and it's gonna got a say great that. vampire yeah so that was the the story of that film you know it was like a real it was like pulling teeth every shooting day <laughs> 
And because there was <laughs> the money wasn't always on time, so the crew wasn't getting paid, so they were going on strike. Sometimes we didn't have enough film to shoot for the next day, so we'd have to really economize on the on the film shooting. Uh, it was a big mess. And the producer, the guy who uh, originally convinced Charlie to shoot there, just locked himself in his hotel room and didn't come out. So it was basically <laughs> Vlad Paunescu kind of... <laughs> kept the crew uh, on track, you know? And every once in a while, I'd look around and Vlad would be gone from the set. And I go, where the fuck is Vlad, you know? And somebody had showed up at the studio with a trunk full of fish or something. And Vlad would run out there and grab a fish because in Romania, if there's food in front of you, you better eat it because you didn't know when you were going to get fed again, you know? Sometimes I'd skip meals and really regret it you know because you know restaurants closed at weird hours and you know we were staying out at a lake you know far away from the city and so yeah so so vlad would be out you know grabbing a fish or a piece of meat and just it was nuts it was the nuttiest thing that i ever experienced up to that time how long did it take to film it oh uh, i think we were in pre-production september maybe we started shooting middle of october and we left like the 20th of December or something like that. It was freezing, but cold too. That was the other problem for the actors. You know, it was just like too cold, too drunk, too much trouble. (laughs) The the big sword fight at the end of the film, we'd start shooting it. And those swords were like heavy fucking real metal swords that had been clashed together so many times. The edges were like saw blades, you know, just like serrated like saw blades. But the guys would be clashing swords and the fucking things would break. And then we go, oh shit, okay, we'd stop filming. Look for the the guy at the at the uh, welding shop at the studio. But he was he had gone home for the day and nobody had a key. There was always the man with the key to open the doors that you needed to get into. If the man with the key wasn't there, you were just totally screwed. So eventually, Anas and Michael would take to getting drunk before doing the sword fights. And, and then I got called up to the to the dressing room one day, like, uh, Mr. Ted, you better come, see, come talk to the actors. And Michael Watson had gone crazy and like, thrown a lamp against the wall. Honest was pissed off about something. And and when he would get pissed off, it was like, you can imagine him as Radu. But when he was pissed off, he could yell at you like nobody ever yelled at you. I went up there and they were like so fucking drunk and waiting to do the, the sword fight. And I went, oh, you guys are too drunk. We're not going to shoot the sword fight. And the stunt man would come up and go, no, 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 no. It's good to be drunk when you do a sword fight. Uh, so it was just like dealing with insane people. You know? <laughs> Recording live from the Black Lodge, it's me, the free will burning, head turning, ass kicking, machismo dripping, master podcast and mouthpiece of the Southeast, uncontested superstar of the airwaves, and your reigning and defending podcast champion of the world. Brandon A. Lane inviting all you fans of Monsters, Madness, and Magic to check out my podcast, Rants from the Black Lodge. What are we all about? Well, let me lay some inside baseball on you. The first of each month, myself and the Rant Army dissect some of cinema's greatest horror and cult films with in-depth retrospectives. Then on the 15th of each month, we present something a little more lighthearted with a fun watch-along commentary for some of cult films' more underappreciated offerings. Rants from the Black Lodge can be found on all major platforms, so hop on over to your app of choice and give us a sub. Follow us on social media at Rants Black Lodge, and for the love of Cthulhu, hop over and check us out on our homepage at JuicyKruger.com. Oh yeah, and please continue to support all the great content by our friends at Monsters, Madness, and Magic. Well, I mean, if it's any consolation, it is one of the most iconic films. It, it has <laughs> stood you. the test of time. Maybe it was like you, you know, talking about the old equipment and stuff, but even that Blu-ray transfer is exquisite, but really so species of VHS. That's the way. <laughs> That's funny, man. Like, that is the way to watch it. It's just that something about. I guess it's the just the full analog cycle from the way it was filmed to actually watching it. That is the ultimate way to experience it. So yeah, <laughs> it, it had a creamy it kind up. of look to it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean I like the Blu-ray. I like the 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 widescreen version of the films because the. 
the locations are just so spectacular I I that you them, would you know? talked about the atmosphere i mean that above all else i would say that's one of those few movies that actually captures the you know you hear all the time aesthetic but it is true there's something about when you pop in that movie you can feel it there's a movie called flesh eater i know it is revenge of the living zombies but when you put that movie in and watch it it feels like appalachian autumn you can huh. it's just one that you know you can smell the smells they run around the forest and you can feel the dampness of the leaves and stuff subspecies it has that feeling you pop it in and it just feels like a almost winter movie and i don't know if it's just you know the way that the coloring finally came out and stuff so yeah it it stands up if anybody yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. anybody questions it they can ask me <laughs> yeah i mean I, I was super lucky that we had juana as the costume designer because she is brilliant and the few notes I would give her of like more layers, more the, she got the aesthetic of the of the film, and and it came out even more in subspecies two and three when Denise Duff took over the Laura Tate role and want to dress her in those like amazing costumes that came supposedly from the basement of the theater. But yeah, I mean it, uh, the combination of locations, actors, and just the the minimalism of the filmmaking, I think you know really helped that film to become what it is. And you, you and we had a lot of advisors, you know. For for the festival that we the little village festival oh um, yeah you know, we spent a lot of time in in pre-production just kind of exploring what that was going to be oh yeah i remember that with that now i do have to say you mentioned subspecies too there's a couple other people that we've podcasted with and i i heartily agree with several people this it's a consensus of our group that we say that subspecies 2 is probably the best actually i would say it is the best full moon movie oh well that's I'm cool it. yeah that is that is full moon if somebody were you know if we because we've done franchise episodes on several of the full moon franchise franchises and stuff but of course subspecies is like the cream of the crop for me but we have talked about subspecies too several times and each time it comes up that yeah that is that is full moon uh -huh. firing on all cylinders is yeah that's cool that's cool thank you yeah i mean i know you know Stuart gordon made some really great movies for full moon and i know the puppet master seems to be kind of the popular uh one of all the full moon movies but i feel like yeah the puppet master and and subspecies are kind of up there mm -hmm. the it's those we've We've even talked about Puppet Master 3. And if somebody were to ask me, like, what's the full moon best? Well, you know, the best movie, like film, probably of full moon would probably be Puppet Master 3. That is about the best. Take it away from everything and uh -huh. just watch it as a standalone film. And that's probably one of the best, if not the best movie. But full moon rocking and rolling katie bar the door here they come it's got to be subspecies too oh, i mean that's cool. just thanks yeah rock and roll it so what was it like subspecies is done you're famous boom top of the world well okay so maybe not but i mean where did you go like <laughs> after the first subspecies and you wouldn't know probably for another 20 or 30 years how badass your legacy actually is but <laughs> I, I didn't know that at un, all until you know? this day because see now you know, <laughs> we'll, know that... we'll come back to this now but see now you know so before you've known this so like after subspecies what was it were you ready to go but not to romania <laughs> take me uh, back to america and do a normal movie or you know what D when we left romania in december it was me and Keith Edmire who was, we were the last two there. Keith was the, the guy who did the makeup applications for Radu. And we were so happy to get the hell out of there. <laughs> but like all kind of intense experiences, like a couple of months later, you like kind of forget all the horrible stuff about it. And you remember kind of those sweet moments when you were drunk with Vlad and Juana in their apartment and they ran out to buy some black market bourbon or something. Or the you stopped along the highway and got some little mitite sausages as you were driving up to Brashoff. The little beautiful moments kind of stick in your head. And I became very nostalgic for uh, that experience because it was also you know like i'm sort of had led a very kind of nice organized life and and you know had a lot of good fortune to edit the movies i did in my career but going to romania was was like kind of hitting the brakes and going what the fuck man 
this is how hard it can be to make a movie. The fact that Paramount really liked the film, they asked for a sequel. And Charlie, you know, not content to do one sequel, wanted to shoot two sequels back to back. So pretty quickly after I came back from Subspecies, I think, no, it was like two years later. So maybe I did Bad Channels or something. I've kind of lose track of the, I have to look at IMDb to kind of keep it all in order. But but I, I did a couple of movies uh, in the States and maybe even remote, that kid's movie that was sort of like Home Alone with remote control toys. Because at that time, Charlie had Empire, but he also then wanted to have, or no, it was Full Moon, then Moonbeam. Then Moonbeam. He, to do, he had some babies and, and suddenly uh, his wife, Debbie Dion, wanted to do some real children's fantasy films. So, so I got on board with some of those. But, and then we, like about 92, invited Vlad and Juana to the United States so that Charlie could set up Castell Film Studios in Bucharest. So I wrote the script for Subspecies 2 and 3 as kind of like one long story. So before I knew it, I was back in Romania doing Subspecies 2 and 3 for a super long production schedule, you know, doing like, you know, 180 pages of screenplay and traveling even farther from Bucharest to Corbin Castle and with Honest Hove, who who by that time we had grown really close. And I said, Honest, let's do this movie, but no drinking on the set, no drinking before we shoot anything. But at the end of the day, when they're taking off your makeup, I'll come in and we'll have a bottle of wine together, you know? So that worked out really well with <laughs> Honest. Um, Michael Watson, I just couldn't have back because he was such a pain in the ass when we were shooting the first one. Laura Tate did not want to come back because she had young children and just couldn't be gone from home for so long. So Denise Duff, like we cast Denise Duff to kind of take over that role. And Denise kind of made it her own, really. Yeah. And Pamela Gordon to play Mummy. And Kevin Spiritas to, to do uh, the Mel Thompson from the U.S. Embassy. So traveling with those guys was like a whole other a whole other experience because now Romania was a little bit happier. There was a little bit more English being spoken, but still you go to these weird places and stay in a little hotel outside of the Corbin Castle. You know, you're not getting any TV reception. You're barely getting any milk for your breakfast or your cereal. And we were getting care packages from Full Moon, you know, of like chips and salt. Also, the kind of stuff that you really miss when you're someplace where you can't get the foods that you're used to. So we traveled a lot more, but Denise is a really great traveler and Kevin's a really great traveler. And so the experience of making subspecies two and three was not quite as full of angst and terrible <laughs> experiences as number one was. And you know, you're right. I think subspecies two is superior to the first one in a lot of ways. You know, we, we kind of mastered some things, but I also like subspecies three because I think it becomes a more psychological and you kind of understand Radu and he becomes a little more vulnerable to the <clears throat> influence of Michelle. So for me, it's like a really interesting trilogy, you know, that went on to have four parts too. And Pamela Gordon was amazing, man, for her to be in that full body makeup. And she couldn't be, she couldn't even see to walk around. We had to kind of have somebody carry her and plop her down uh, oh. on the set. So it was a, it was a cool experience. And the, the doing makeup was, was a uh, normal. Norman Cabrera and Wayne Toth, who were an amazing duo and really fun to work with and ended up kind of playing the rock band in the nightclub that so did you intentionally and i don't know maybe it's just interpretation or maybe you don't even want to answer and tell me to you know kiss off if, if you really don't want to answer it but i think it was in the third one in the first subspecies they talk about radu and how he was possibly you know it was he's a monster but you know you have everybody else is a nice vampire but radu's not so what happened and there's illusions that you know he was a monster and it was because of what he was but then you meet mum me, who is a witch and i really love that interspersing the black magic aspects of it the sorcery to it making opening up the world if you will but then in the third one radu mentions how he has just killed his family for her uh, he's looking at michelle and says i just killed my family for you and what would you give me in return for this and she doesn't and it's in that moment that radu actually becomes almost almost the sympathetic character was that intentional or did you just kind of or did it just kind of the script ends up going that way and you're like oh yeah we'll we'll take it that way you know in the subspecies one he kills his father mm. and his in subspecies two he kills his brother so it seemed to me okay mummy is an irritant 
to Radu, you know, and constantly warning him against Michelle. So he's got to really choose between Michelle and his allegiance to Mummy. And that particular scene where he kills her, you know, the dialogue was written in that same way that Radu did the sort of the same speech in Subspecies One, you know, now I have it all, man. It was going to be just kind of raging like Radu. And Honest kind of came up with the idea. He said, you know, what if instead of being full on Radu for this moment, I'm like completely completely drained from the emotion of it all. And I said, wow, that's kind of an interesting idea. How would that sound? And he kind of did the speech that way. And that's kind of what, it was like a surprise to me. One of those moments where what I imagined was going to be in the movie suddenly took a turn because an actor really had a better idea or an idea that kind of somehow, you know, he felt closer to. So that was one of those moments where you just kind of let go of whatever you were thinking before and marvel at uh, the actor's craft let's stay on radu for a second was there ever any other choice other than mr hove when he came in was there an audition we auditioned the hell out of actors for radu and we settled on a guy because i was time was running out i was like about to leave for romania and we still hadn't found radu and we still hadn't found stefan either so we settled on this guy who was kind of a very arch kind of actor to do radu didn't have the sexual kind of vibe that honest has or the kind of mick jack kind of rock and roll feel that Anna says. And I flew off to Bucharest thinking this was the guy. In the meantime, the casting still went on without me. And Charlie and Debbie and the casting directors met Michael Watson and loved him as as uh, Stefan. And Michael at the time was working on General Hospital and working with an actor named Anas Hove. And Michael said, you know what? I got a friend who would be great for this role. And so he is actually the one who turned the turned us on to Anas. Anas came in and read for Charlie and Debbie and they loved him. And they called me and said, hey man, we have, you know, forget that old other guy. We've got the Radu for you. So it was, for me, it was a surprise to, to meet both Michael and Anas when they came to, to Bucharest. Me and Daniel were kind of talking about this before you got in here. I want to ask, where does the vampire journey fit exactly in the subspecies timeline is it between three and four <laughs> you know i'm really hard at uh it's very hard for me to have a clear timeline of all of this there's no I wrong think, answer <laughs> yeah i think there's you no would wrong have answer. to say it's probably it occurs bef before number four because because there are certain references you know and subspecies five which you know as soon as COVID is is safe we're going to go shoot that that's going to explain the backstory of radu back Ooh. to even before he was a vampire so uh, a lot of that will be will be explained but yeah so so vampire journals was you know after subspecies three charlie said hey what if we did a vampire movie he's a gambler so he loves the idea of casinos what if we did a you know not ugly vampires but beautiful vampires and did a story about a vampires that live under a casino and that idea kind of struck me as really interesting i like i said at the beginning of this i was never a vampire fan as a kid i loved more made up monsters but but in the course of doing subspecies, I came to understand kind of what makes a vampire even more interesting of a of a monster and the idea of the weight of eternity and the loneliness and the kind of looking forward to nothing in your life. So when Charlie suggested that, by that time I knew the locations in Bucharest and I could just see, you know, like this underground and the tunnels that, that exist under Bucharest, the ruined buildings with incredibly decayed staircases. And so I wrote that script and went to Bucharest and we started pre-production. By this time, Vlad was busy kind of running the studio and wasn't going to be a director of photography anymore. So I got paired with Adolfo Bartoli, who had shot, you know, some of the kids' movies that I did and is an incredible artist, you know, like Italian master of light. So... But he's kind of a, you know, like a prickly guy to work with. But so we would spend the, all of pre-production there. And in the middle of pre-production, Charlie ran out of money. So we couldn't oh, start yeah. actually shooting. But he had enough money to keep us in Bucharest while he was scrambling about for the financing. So Adolfo and I and the production designer, Vali Kalinescu, who was just a brilliant production designer, spent a lot of time together just going back to the locations again and again, spent time at the bookstore looking at books of painting 
paintings from the, the early Renaissance and the late Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance and talking about light and composition. And Adolfo pushed Adolfo to, to come up with a new look for vampire journals and the combination of the locations that we had access to and his light kind of made that movie even more magical. And then, you know, the casting, the, 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 the like I said, the Romanian actors are brilliant, you know, and really perfectly trained. And the problem is finding ones who can speak English well enough to kind of get the lines out. But Ilinka Goya, who plays Ash's protege vampire, was amazing. You know, she, she just carried this vibe of like the princess in the tower with her, mm-hmm. you know. And so that movie was really a fun one to make because we got to kind of present Bucharest in, in all its kind of decayed beauty and shoot in amazing location. That is my favorite vampire movie. Oh, really? It, That's amazing. Yeah. That is everything I do, my writing and my music and my composition, everything. It could pretty, you could basically funnel it all the way back to vampire journals, subspecies and freaking the forever night TV show. That's it's, cool, man. Every, That's very cool. every year it's vampire journals. I, I watch it like as part of October ritual or really just autumn ritual. Oh, that's I cool. I don't have to limit it to that, but you certainly, you nailed aesthetic perfectly with vampire journals. That was the thing, you know, like, uh, you know, we were really lucky with Jonathan Morris to play Ash because he sort of had, I mean, he was a musical comedy guy in English TV and stuff, and but he had something about him and and uh, Zachary was great and, and Kirsten who played the pianist. Uh, every actor in that movie was really great. And, you know, I, I look at the films and I'm like, wow, it's a little bit slow. And I think that's the, the criticism leveled at them always is the pace is too slow. And part of that is because when you're shooting on a Charlie Band schedule, you you know, there's not a lot of time to detail and, and you don't want to have too much action because it takes too long to shoot. And in my case, I like kind of shoot and try to make cool shots and, and then get behind in the schedule. So by the end, at the climax of the movie, you're shooting at the end, you got to like figure out a way to do it as fast as possible. So, so they're all kind of compromised by the way that, that we were making movies in those days. But I'm proud of that film because I think it really looks like real spectacular that's one of the ones i'll like this is one of the films i'll forgive most of the time yeah the movie (laughs) if the movie's boring oh i will strafe it in reviews Uh it it has taken me almost two decades to finally come around to ridley scott you couldn't pay me to what because his movie's so boring but, oh man <laughs> it <laughs> wasn't him great man well see yeah. i know and i have come around but and it's not him as bad as kubrick so the worst thing you can do watch, when watching a movie is bore me however yeah, yeah. for some reason vampire journals i think it's just one of those it's atmosphere and also subject matter it's not monkeys throwing a bone in the air staring at a rock it's a bunch of vampires walking around in a suit even if it's going to be implied violence the violence is there because you've got zachary walking around moping poor moping zachary about oh, this, uh, with a sword and then stuff happens it just you nailed it perfect and i have because i i will hijack the whole thing and i'm trying not to i'm trying to behave myself because even though you're one of my favorite directors here why is there no blu-ray for subspecies four now here's why because that was right at the beginning of the digital era and that film we shot it on film adolfo shot that film too so that's why it's got a much different look than the Vlad subspecies but we finished it all the previous films we cut the negative and did it like old school and there a, vi- a version existed in the in negative for subspecies four it was just assembled digitally and it was assembled so the only way to re to, to release a blu-ray would be to go back through all of the negative get a edit decision list of all of the negative and assemble it from the negative wow. because the assembly that was done for the VHS release is not HD. So there's no, I believe is the, is the reason why it cannot be, you know, who invented the shadow wall? Your movies were the first ones to show the vampire and become a shadow. And I just, I called it shadow walking in Dungeons and Dragons because I didn't know. Or like, what's that? It's like, did subspecies when they like that. I, I think I stole it from Nosferatu, the vampire, like the from the 30s or 20s. The idea of vampire represented by shadow. I don't know if he actually flew off in shadow. I don't think he did in Nosferatu. 
in the first subspecies, we just, I went, you know what, it would be really cool if instead of becoming a bat, you know, like, uh, like uh, Bela Lugosi, if Radu could, be, could just travel as a shadow. And so Vlad and I kind of talked to the electricians and the grips about how could we possibly do that? And we kind of came up with this setup where it'd be like a big 12K light kind of lighting the building and a section of dolly track kind of going off at a slight angle and then put Radu on the dolly track and dolly him so that he would get closer to the light and his shadow would grow larger. So that's what we did. I think we used it a little bit in subspecies one, but then uh, really kind mm-hmm. of perfected it in subspecies two and vampire journals. Now you're okay. Another question. I know y'all leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> you say that you're like, you play guitar, you're a musician and stuff. So did you have full control over the soundtracks of these films? Because just like vampire journals is my favorite vampire flick. The score in that movie is, I mean, if I say gorgeous, that just sounds so trite. That music is beautiful and so i'm just curious if you're like you just happen here like ah hell yeah just throw in there it'll be fine or if you actively had something a say in the soundtracks for all the subspecies in the vampire journals for subspecies i really wanted to use like romanian instruments and kind of create a the vibe of romania as much as possible and when we were in post-production my wife was a big fan of kcrw like the santa monica community college radio station that plays really eclectic music and one morning she heard Amon Folk Ensemble on KCRW and she said, man, this is the band you really should contact because they have that vibe that you're looking for. And so we reached out to Amon Folk Ensemble. They had all the instruments, they had uh, fiddle players and cymbalum and, and like these incredible instruments. They also were allied with a composer, a couple of composers. So between the Amon Folk Ensemble and the composers, they set out to create the score and basically you would sit down and and show them the edited film and say you know music here music there this kind of music here and just kind of talk it through and where the where the music goes and then they came back with that score and i didn't really change it at all you know it was like super good yeah that c minor riff just from subspecies even now i still i play around with it or i'll even alter it for another song or depending on a score but certainly if i'm doing any kind of gothic horror or a va- especially a vampire is c minor and then i have to actively <laughs> try funny, to not <laughs> emulate that lick or and the choir the just the folk choirs that they use for that soundtrack in the subspecies films is so haunting and now of course it's iconic but just decades ago watching it and just hearing it, it was incredibly unique. And I don't yeah, know the, the changes, the chord changes in that in that kind of vampire in the subspecies theme are really pretty cool. Yeah. I don't yeah. know the instrument, but I've mentioned it before in my analysis of the score of subspecies and the lighting is what makes that movie. There's a certain sequence that shows Radu. You'll remember it is you've seen it so many times, like in videos on a stuff of you know, Radu skulking in the catacombs, just walking toward the camera, uh-huh. and y'all you're just tracking back away from it, and it just shows it obscured by shadow. The instrument that you hear, I don't know how to pronounce it, the duduk. It's that the that woodwind bass in that you know like that that is iconic film for yeah, people yeah. in horror nowadays now you know back then i don't know if you even knew what it would be now yeah that's cool that corridor you're talking about was like in the kind of the monastery that we shot in uh, Prejmer. that was one of those moments where it was at the beginning of the shoot and honest didn't really know how Radu was supposed to move or, or speak. And so we just would go places and go, okay, try walking kind of weird and let's see what that looks like. And and so that was a particularly weird walk, you know, and, and sometimes he didn't do it quite like that. But that was like one of those moments that it's like, wow, this is, this looks cool because the, the light kind of comes through the little tiny port windows of the, of the corridor and open spaces that look down into the monk's chambers, you know, all of that, mm-hmm. and everything was just so incredible like such a joy to be able to go into a location and go wow i can shoot here it's incredible and and the churches the churches were spectacular and everything was available to us back then not so easy to shoot there now as it as it was back then 
touched on it a little bit, Ted. What can you tell us about subspecies five? Are we going to some similar locations? Cast returning? What what can you tell uh, us? Who is returning is Anas. Denise Duff is returning. I think we got Kevin Spiritas. He really wants to come uh, work nice. on the film. And because Romania is now too busy and too expensive for the kind of movie that Charlie can afford to make, we've been talking to a production company in Serbia. I scouted locations before the pandemic in Albania and spent a week there while they were shooting Castle Freak, that new version of Castle ah. Freak. But the castles there didn't strike me as being particularly wonderful. And, and there were some castles and I was like, okay, I could make this work. But the city itself, Tirana, somehow either it never had or the communists destroyed everything from the turn of the 20th century, you know? So it didn't have that kind of neo- uh, gothic kind of architecture that you need for the cities or the concert halls. I mean, Romania just had all of that. And even if it was a little wrecked, it was so beautifully styled because Romania was like the little Paris of the 20s and 30s. So Albania, I scouted, but didn't work. So the people that are helping us kind of find a foreign location suggested Serbia. Now, Serbia seems like the, the place. I haven't gone to scout locations, but I've seen photographs. So we were going to go in September, but I think Charlie decided COVID was still a little too much of a threat to the production and to the travel mm. and, and, you know, maybe mm. cost too much money, you know, if we had to halt shooting. So we'll probably do it in the springtime now. I met him at a hot con uh, in 2019, right sure. before <laughs> right before the lockdown. And I was in a course gushing and talk, cause I had no clue. I w at hot con is a trade show and I had no idea I would be seeing his booth there and everything. I was like, Charles, ah, Charles, man, it's Charles. <laughs> I'm running. You can hear me at the Ernest P. Worrell Center or whatever it's called. It's, just, ah, it's Charles, it's Charles, man. <laughs> I mean, I am ecstatic. And yeah, so after the gush fest, and I'm shaking his hand, and then I shake. It's like, oh hell no, you shake both of them. Rub some of that, get some of that talent on my hands. I want a production <laughs> company, but yeah, I ended up asking. So tell me. Subspecies four. Why is it not a Blu-ray? <laughs> and he, uh, I forget what answer it was. I think he was being, it was a polite way of telling me to piss off. Uh -huh. um, but it, it was just, it. Was, I don't think he was even expecting that remotely. So I'll forgive you that. Yeah, that just to see him, and I, I asked you about. So subspecies five. Got any details and stuff? And he was like, oh, where is him? He didn't really. Yeah, uh, poor <laughs> guy. We got a trunk poor of guy. Puppet Master Blu-rays here. Yeah, it's a new trunk. <laughs> hey, thanks. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, so I appreciate. It. Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> He's been. Uh, yeah, poor Charlie. I mean, I wrote that script like, whoo, man, back probably probably 97, something like that, 98 wrote the script. And so ever since then, he's been inundated with people wondering about subspecies five. And, and we were honestly ready to shoot it before COVID would have done it, you know, and, and COVID just kind of put the yeah. monkey wrench in it one more time. But it's basically going to be the story of Radu from his birth to, and then kind of like in five sections, like a hundred or 200 years apart, kind of show his evolution from Radu, kind of a, a crusader to to Radu, the the vampire that we know and love. That awesome. yeah, I'm just I'm stoked. I don't care. I'm buying it day one. I mean, <laughs> it should what, be I cool. Buy, I give it. I've already let you. I mean, everybody knows I'm a mark now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, I, oh god, you know what I just saw? You did the Saint Francisville experiment. Oh, that was a uh, yeah. My name was not supposed to be on that film. Actually. Why not, dude? That dude, that movie is freaking awesome. Holy oh, crap! That's cool. You know, that was uh, one of those movies that Charlie was going to direct, and the day before he was going to go because it was basically a one day shoot, two really? days. You know, one day for the interviews, one day for the night of that the kids would spend in the mansion. But the day before he was going to shoot it, he either he decided it was didn't want to be responsible for it or he had something else to do i don't know what he said what you want to go and shoot this movie and you know i'm like up for any kind of weird adventure like that so i said sure yeah went there and really the the house was supposed to be full of gags that we we're going to scare the fuck out of the kids that were in there <laughs> and there was only about one gag in there which is the flying chair so 
we kind of quickly did what we could do or pounded on walls and stuff and tried to do something, shot the whole thing. And it was very, I'm trying to remember even how we shot it because the kids were in the in the building. We were in a trailer out back. And I think all we could do was hear what they were saying because there wasn't, there, at that time, there weren't transmitters for their cameras so we could see what was going on. So we shot it and then spent a lot of time editing it. And I was like, just, just you know, I'll, I'll use my pseudonym on this film, but I really don't because I didn't feel responsible enough for for it or that it was delivering enough dude uh, it was unscripted the gags yeah, was, and stuff y'all were doing that was holy that was shit all, no that was all the improv with the kids that were in the house dude this movie Everything. is brilliant i watched yeah. it a buddy of mine and we were you know just the typical metallica metalheads megadeth written full moon movies on the weekends and you know <laughs> rc cola and tom's potato chips it was every <laughs> week nonstop. we were incorrigible but i remember him telling me about this movie it's called the saint francisville experiment asked if i had seen it i was like no because i mean we were you know, head over heels for blair witch project so found footage flicks you know back then there's no internet it was still believable and you know this stuff was i'd still believe it so anyway i watched the saint francisville experiment i freaking loved it i just oh that's good that's... i love it for what it is it's, i mean I, maybe i'm easy to please which, then... i mean i am if the content is cool but still the movie was cool i didn't but i didn't know that it was unscripted that's brilliant yeah, it was. Uh, that's cool. I'm glad to hear that, that some people like that film, but it was, we shot it, edited it, and then Peter Locke, who was going to distribute it uh, or was co-funding co it or something, kind of took it over from Charlie and had me, we set up another shoot with some more scenes. And, and so, so the basic part of it is there, uh, was all improvised. And then certain scenes are additionally shot and not scripted so much as just outlined. And then the kids kind of took it on mm -hmm. their own. So we shot like another two or three days, additional scenes to kind of amp up the events that happened in the house. Freaking brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it awesome. was like a crazy, crazy production. And I, I was like, oh, I don't want my name on this because I don't feel responsible enough for the craft that went into it or the, the thought that went into it. But at some point, somebody decided my name on it was going to be better for selling it overseas or whatever, for whatever reason, my name got on it. And now I'm kind of glad it did because I don't get like residuals because none of Charlie's movies were, you know, Writers Guild or Directors Guild. But I do get like payments from Europe for videotape people that maybe recorded off the TV. So they come up with some formula. And most of the money that I get on those checks is fucking uh, the St. Francisville experiment. So it's being seen <laughs> somewhere, you know. <laughs> See, that is awesome. <laughs> oh, yes. I did have to ask you about Dragon World. That's one of okay. the movies I watched a lot as a kid. Was that oh, your... Oh, cool. Yeah. Was that your very first attempt at trying to write a script aimed towards children? I think before Dragon World, I think Remote came remote. I didn't write that uh, the script for Remote, but Dragon World was... I was so glad that that movie came my way because, you know, there's one. it's one thing to make monster movies and vampire movies, and it's really fun and creating that kind kind of atmosphere but to to make a great fantasy movie for a kid there's something magical about that and because we were able to shoot that in the UK and I had access then to these amazing actors like Andrew Keir the the process of making that film was like one of the more magical beautiful experiences uh just going to England traveling up to the to the countryside and and, and shooting in that castle and on the moors and working with the English crew and the guys that created the monster uh, Mark uh, and his gang were like everybody was at the top of their game you know creating the you know basically we had a dragon head and neck in full scale and then the little baby dragon was a full scale puppet and then the rest was kind of stop motion and and very early cg but yeah that movie because the actors were so special and the locations were so fantastic and andrew Keir just kind of brought such depth of love and gravity to the to that character it was like to me it was like the most uh, um, intense labor of love of any of the movies that i've made i wish the paramount would release it you know now that they've got paramount plus maybe they will you know as a kids movie because that that to me is like it's kind of rudimentary and not what you expect in a big cg dragon movie of these days but there's something kind of charming about its simplicity in a way yeah. you know Hello kitties, welcome.
come to dance from the crib. <laughs> Hello, boys and ghouls. Welcome to Dads from the Crypt, a weekly podcast where three dads who love horror movies review the Tales from the Crypt TV series and movies. My name is Jason. I'll be joined by fellow dads Jody and Mondo. Join us as we dive into the plot, talent, and source comics of the iconic HBO series. There will also be music recommendations, trivia, and dad advice. Look for the Dads from the Crypt podcast on your favorite podcast app starting on Father's Day. And follow us on our Facebook group, Twitter at Crypt Dads, and Instagram at Dads from the Crypt. Follow Dads from the Crypt, or I will follow you to the grave. <laughs> How big That's- was that head to scale? That head was full on it was as big as it was it was probably eight feet long from snout to back (laughs) and then was on a big kind of tractor that kind of lifted it up and down and brought it out to the location it was spectacular creation (laughs) (laughs) to date for your whole career what would you say is the best filmmaking advice you've received best filmmaking advice i received two things (laughs) one shoot everything in this direction first don't shoot in this direction turn around and do this and then turn around again Uh, Adolfo Bartoli was like always on my ass about that. Shoot everything this way. You'll save time in the lighting and then turn around and shoot reverses if you must. Number one. Number two is having been an editor, I sort of came to the understanding that you can fix a lot of problems in editing. And that's kind of the the, the (laughs) special bond between a director and an editor is I, the director, fucked up big time. Many, many, many scenes of this film I fucked up by rushing it too much or not realizing how important the scene was or just forgot a shot. And working with the editor, I've managed to make it so that you don't notice any of that stuff in most of in most of the instances, you know? So I think that's, you know, editing is important and shoot in one direction. And let's see, what would be the other one? That's, that's basically it. I mean, there's tons of little things you learn along the way, but what you learn from the people that you work with are, are those kind of things, you know? So I like to ask everybody that we talk to, what's your go-to movie snack? that one thing that you just have to munch on to make <laughs> movie watching experience the total package you know what i'm tr- i try so hard to not eat sugar uh, <laughs> but i cannot avoid it you know i can't can for a couple of days at a time and but my wife loves it and so so there's always something here i would have to say cookies are always great mm-hmm. cheetos are f- uh, amazing popcorn but especially that kind of salty sweet popcorn that's oh, like made that nowadays corn. that you can eat that like crazy i think brownies probably because they're the most oh, yeah. chocolatey concoction that you can put in your mouth <laughs> so or at costco they sell those little blueberry covered with chocolate blueberry kind of yes jelly those are fucking so addictive i can (laughs) eat them for three hours straight just like one at a time so yeah that's that's the those are the things do you like cinnamon toast crunch a cereal Uh uh-huh the cereal you know what i i probably would but when i buy cereal i'm looking for like no sugar you know what i mean like uh so so it's like so you got the snack what's your favorite movie Ooh, that would be a super hard question come on on the spot favorite movie (laughs) i mean i guess i i I would have to say charlie's not listening so i mean you could say whatever (laughs) movie you want yeah no my favorite movies are like martin scorsese films you know and i would have to say maybe goodfellas might be one of my favorites that movie is like a film school in a film but (laughs) also you know what i really love is touch of evil orson welles film touch of evil that is like another film where you can see how to make a movie for a very low budget and how to compose shots and how to block actors to a lens. That movie is spectacular. You know, Touch of Evil? Not uh, Angelique does. I have not. Wow, man, you got to see it. it. It's I'm, so great. It's such a great film noir. It's it's really trashy in some respects. Like, wait a minute. You know, 
let me see the cover. I may have seen it. It's, I'm an 80s kid. If I don't know the cover, if I don't know the title, let me look at the cover and I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, Let's it's see. a great film. It's, I mean, it's a great, it's a trashy film, but it's great trash. No, know? but I'm on it if it's a, oh, it's yeah. a noir. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's oh, a yeah. noir and it's Orson Welles playing one of the most evil, corrupt cops you've ever seen. And it's in Venice, California, kind of subbing for Mexico. It's, it's a great film. And and plus, it teaches you a lot about how to make a movie. Well, Ted, it's been a pleasure. I guess to hey, wrap man, up fun here. fun talking to you guys. Yeah. Hey, what, yeah. What, do, what do you have on the horizon? Tell us what Please, you have on the yeah. horizon to wrap up here. Oh, I'm working on a script for some guys that uh, I've come in contact with. That's kind of a, a another comedy monster movie that in the realm of television that they wanted to try to put together. So I'm hoping that's going to, I'm just kind of going through and trimming the script down as much as possible before I give it over to them. So I'm working on that and just waiting for subspecies uh, number five to come along, you know, and look at, you know, I did that movie, a little short, a little one hour movie for Charlie called uh, Don't Let Her In recently, kind of a demonic possession movie that's available on full moon uh, and that's pretty good for for a very short short schedule i had really great cast for that one uh so that's worth checking out we'll definitely do that we're all looking forward to subspecies five yeah all right man i think yeah i think i've made it clear where i stand <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. your oeuvre and everything uh, yeah. so yeah there's no need for any of that you are always welcome I'll try yeah. not to disappoint you. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, it's been a pleasure. You have a great rest of your night, man. Hey, great talking to you, Justin, Daniel, Angelique. You guys take Thank care. Thank you. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.